Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, on this Sunday when we remember Jesus' baptism, one of those points in Scripture where God does choose to get a little flashy with the Spirit descending in what looks like bodily form and the voice from heaven saying, This is my Son. It's important to talk about baptism. But I want to talk about an angle that's a bit different than what you're used to. You see, the baptism of Jesus is the beginning of his mission and ministry. From this point, when he's baptized and the Spirit descends on him, he goes out to begin his ministry. As Scripture describes it, his work of reconciling love, of bringing all that is broken back to wholeness and life. Our baptisms, where we are reconciled to God, as McKinley was this morning, where we are named and claimed as children of God, where we are given the gift of forgiveness and made whole in God, is also our individual calling to ministry in God's world. As we remember the baptism of Jesus and remember our own baptisms and experiencing it with McKinley this morning, It just seems a great time to talk about our collective mission as a church. If you haven't noticed, the world is changing. (laughs) Always has, always will. But today it happens at a faster and faster pace. Our congregation's context for the mission and ministry we have been called to continues to change as well. From 110 years ago when a a few farming families formed a church on the edge of the Texas hill country by gathering under those trees over there, to today being a large church right on Loop 1604 in the middle of booming suburbia, we definitely can say our context for ministry keeps changing. And we continue to be grateful for those members and families who laid the foundation for this mission center we call Zion Lutheran Church. We trust that the Holy Spirit has been at work and is with us still, and that the same Spirit continues to call us into God's future. And as we look to that future, we know the world is changing. Down through human history, there have been these major shifts in how human beings see the world and how we operate together. The sociologists and cultural anthropologists have names for them that you've heard of before. The Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Renaissance and Enlightenment, the Industrial Age, the Modern Age. These ages are where everything shifts then to something new, a different pattern of operating. One of these major shifts has begun and is happening now. Where it's going, we don't know. That's why the scientists don't have a name for it. It's just called postmodern. We've been in the modern era. We're going to something else, so it's just post modern. And these shifts don't happen overnight. They can take generations. But there is a move from what was in modernity to what will be. And at this moment in time, 
as our congregation celebrates 110 years as a church, I'm looking forward to this congregation's 150th and 200th birthdays. And I believe as ELCA Lutherans and as Zion Lutheran Church, we are set up well for the future. We have been blessed. And today I want to share a few reasons why I believe that. First, foremost, and always, we are set up well for the future because Christ is with us. I want to start every worship service at times by saying, hey, people, remember, we gather this morning in the real presence of Jesus. Jesus is here with us in our worship. He is here for us. Having that in mind that Christ is with us changes everything. That's where we have to begin our thoughts of life and mission together. But in the terms of the global changes, the shift that's happening, there are some trends that point in our favor as well. First one is, a major trend shows people seeking a sense of mystery and ritual once again. The world has gotten so analytical and cold and technical that people are longing for the sense of the divine and the mysterious. Look at the growth in the New Age movement over the last couple decades. Look at the growth in Eastern religions, in nature religions. It'll tell you something. There is a hunger for that deep sense of the divine in mystery. And we as Lutherans can speak to this hunger, but we actually have to speak <laughs> to share this place where we find meaning and mystery in worship. You see, our worship, whether it's 8, 9, 30, or 11, our worship is part of an ancient ritual filled with a sense of mystery and wonder. We embrace that ancient tradition while seeking continually new ways to express those patterns that we have in our worship life. We use organs, we use pianos, guitars. What are the resources God is providing for us? That's what we want to use to involve ourselves in this experience of God's presence. We are not hip and never will be. And I think that's a good thing because there is an appeal in good Lutheran worship that will serve God's people well in the years ahead. Second, people are becoming less and less comfortable with dogmatic, heavy-handed religion. Tell most people today, you must. And at their most polite, they'll say, why? Our Lutheran church, at its roots, hasn't been about handing down answers that you must accept and believe. Lutheran faith is not a musty religion. It's not filled with you must, you must, you must. From the birth of Lutheranism, it's been about wrestling with God and wrestling with life and doing them together. We are much more comfortable living with the questions of faith and life versus simplistic legalism and easy answers. Now, as a congregation, we do need to do a better job of providing space for that wrestling to happen in our life together. A place where questions about God and life are taken seriously and, and where differences in perspective are welcomed is space where God will be at work in, on, and through his people. Three, Younger generations in particular have an approach to life that says, don't tell me about your faith, show me. Don't give me your doctrine, show me your life. And there's something I admire in that. Christianity isn't supposed to be about accepting a set of doctrines and seeing if you conform. It's all about relationship. The Bible 
from beginning to end is all about relationship. Our relationship with God, our relationship with others, our relationship with God's world. It's at the heart of our mission and supposed to be the focus of all we do. In our worship as we gather together, in our study, in our serving those in need, in our mission trips to connect with more of God's world. It's about deepening relationships and, and seeing God at work in us and seeing the face of Christ in the face of the other. An inclusive kind of relationship is what biblical faith is all about as Christ seeks to bring all creation back together. Fourth, the idea of top-down organizations just doesn't work anymore. Companies that seek to bring in the talents and creativity of younger generations have to find ways to accomplish their goals while allowing their people freedom to be who they are in their styles of work and life. If you want, you can go and read a thousand articles about this change in the workplace. It's participatory. And one of the basic tenets of Lutheran faith in life is a concept called the priesthood of all believers. Yes, you are a priest. You are a minister. This church is not supposed to be dependent on the professional clergy for ministry to happen. We are not a clergy-centric denomination. And there's something coming to Zion this year that I think is going to help us to explore more of this concept of the priesthood of all believers. Our new director of congregational life, Ronnie Harlan, she's been digging into this, and she has a new tool for us. It's called PLACE. P-L-A-C-E. You'll hear what the acronym is all about later on. But basically, it's a tool to help us as individuals better assess our own spiritual gifts, our talents, our passions in life, and help us find that place within what God is up to in the world, connecting real people with real ministry. And in the process, I think we find more real, deeper connections with one another. So stay tuned and watch for that place. It's coming soon. As God's mission center called Zion Lutheran Church, we're being called to life in a new context, a new mission field. And I think it's an exciting time to be the church. No longer are we the, the small country church, and yet we're not called to be a mega church either. Let's get that clear. We are not called to be a megachurch either. <laughs> but we are called to grow in a growing and changing environment. I do think we can probably be a healthy church that worships about seven to 800 a week in this setting with the available land being our only limitation. And by the way, the way that growth happens best is through you the ministers of this church. Evangelism happens best when one person tells another whom they already know about what is truly important to them. So pray that God will open us up to be able to invite others to, to come and see, to come and meet this God we know, this God of infinite grace and mercy who loves us so dearly. I also think Zion Lutheran is being called to a leadership role in our synod. We are the largest ELCA congregation in our synod and in the state of Texas. I think that means we have some responsibilities. Now, this leadership is not an egocentric, let us tell you how to do things. It's more of a servant leadership. We need to be open to hosting training events for, for Christ's church right here. Things that we've already done and have possibilities for more. Things like the global mission gathering, uh, the worship conference, the healthy congregations training. We can become more of a teaching center for the church. Again, not because we know it all or have it down right, but because 
with great blessing comes great responsibility. With great blessing comes great responsibility. And here we have wonderful accessibility, a marvelous staff, and a healthy congregation ready to serve. And to better equip us to follow our calling to be a mission center, I think we do need to talk about building in several ways. One is on everybody's mind right now. It's building in terms of our facilities. We have kicked the can down the road about as far as we can go in addressing our issues with aging facilities. So I'm excited to see what our future may hold as we gather this afternoon to to hear more from our architect as he proposes solutions to the problems that we face. The building will be an exciting time, but as we get into this, I want to remind everyone, everyone, buildings can never be a goal in and of themselves. Buildings are not a mission. I've heard congregations get into the mindset of, oh, we need to get into a building project together because that'll bring everybody back together bull cookies. <laughs> Because I guarantee it's going to add a lot of stress. Buildings are not a mission, but they are necessary tools for churches to do ministry. Second aspect of building is building our people, deepening our connections with one another. I'm really excited to see what this tool, Place, has to offer us there as we find out more about ourselves as individuals and a congregation and how we can work together better to accomplish God's purposes. But also building our people in terms of seeking to grow in our faith. It's not about numbers, really. It's about relationship. And we want to see how we can grow further in our relationship with God. And Pastor Russell has some new initiatives on those lines that he's going to bring to the congregation a little bit later in 2014. So stay tuned for that as well. And the third aspect of building is building our relationships with the community. We need to find ways to strengthen our connections to the community that we serve. Because in those connections is the fertile soil where relationship can grow. We as Zion Lutheran Church have a history that has served us well. And now we continue to be blessed for ministry in the future. And I believe we're set up well to serve a changing world. So we may we pray that God guide us and direct us as we seek to serve. May God Forgive us and lift us up again when we fall, and we will. May God embolden us as his people to invite those we know to come and experience our God of grace and mercy. For the world so desperately needs to know, to hear, to taste, to feel God's deep deep love for all God's people. Use us, O Lord, for by your baptismal calling, we are your people. And to God be the glory. Amen.